Okay, now that we know the classification of the insects, we know the external anatomy and a little bit about the internal anatomy and the physiology of the insects, we're going to go on to uh, the description of the major orders and some of the important and interesting things about all these different insects. So this is what you looked at in lab. So you had the chance to look at all of these um, different insects, the orders of a lot of different insects, so you should have a general idea of the major physical characteristics that you can use to determine which order is which. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at each order or each of the major orders. And I'm going to be telling you about a few stories about why that order is important, maybe some interesting things about their habitat, some of the major physical characteristics, that sort of thing. That way, when you get out into the world, when you get out into your real jobs, you will at least be familiar with most of the insects that you are going to come across. After we finish this, then we are going to move on to just the veterinarily important insects. And we're going to go into those insects in a much greater depth. So I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different species of insects that you will likely run into out in the real world. And you're going to learn how to differentiate between those. But for now, let's just talk about insect systematics. So... Insect systematics is the study of the relationships between groups of literally any size. So this can include individual species. It can include genera or families or orders or populations of mixed species, populations of genera, of families, of orders, whatever. It's just comparison among groups. We just want to compare uh, and contrast, really, the relationships within and between these groups, which is why we study insect systematics. So to do this, we use DNA characteristics, we use morphological characteristics, which you should be very, very um, in tune with or very uh, familiar with from your lab. We use evolutionary traits. We use uh, ecological habitats, pretty much anything that we can uh, identify uh, um, as uh, specific to different groups. We use these to compare. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through a bunch of orders over the next several lectures. You're going to find that these match uh, what is in your book and what is in your lab manual, at least for the most part. However, there is a possibility that you're going to read something somewhere that differs. So try to keep in mind what we talked about during the very beginning of the semester. The names and the classifications of insects change as we get more information about an insect or about a group. So you might see things that are called by different names, see things that are classified slightly differently or grouped together slightly differently. The names that I'm going to teach you in this class are standard for right now. Uh, if you ever get into a class that uses a different name, however, simply learn the name or that name for the purposes of that class. Easy day, right? Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, the, you will see a couple of references this semester likely that have slightly different names. Uh, always fall back to what I'm teaching you in lecture and in your book. All right, let's get started, shall we? So we are going to start with the primitive orders. Um, <clears throat> these orders are groups of insects that haven't changed much over the millennia. They still have the same basic adaptations, the same basic habitats that they did millions of years ago. So the very first order is called the Columbula. These insects are very tiny. They're less than six millimeters long. Uh, they're wingless and they tend to be found in damp habitats like small pools or damp leaves, that sort of thing, maybe in the soil. They are commonly known as springtails. This is because they have a ventral spring-like apparatus that allows them to jump considerable distances. So you can see that uh, close up on this video here. You see these little spring-like things right there? Those are the spring tails for the spring tail. Okay. Now, I'm going to take a second to tell you about common names. Common names are a pain. Oh, they're awful. Because by their very nature, they've been made up by different people at different 
times. We tend to see lots of different common names based on regions or generations or heritage of people, you know, all that sort of stuff. And using common names makes it very, very difficult to really discuss an insect across different groups of people. So Calimbula, for example, here, they're commonly called springtails by entomologists, but I've heard them called soil fleas, jump bugs, little critters, soil lice, jump beetles, that sort of thing. How confusing is that? And depending on where you live, you're going to hear these different terms for these sorts of things. So this is why I want you to learn the correct order and sometimes the species name of various insects. So that when you're, when you're talking about a particular insect, you're going to be able to clearly articulate what you mean. However, I'm also going to teach you the most commonly used common names. So when you uh, meet people or when you talk to people who use these common names, you know what they're talking about and you can uh, understand the type of insect that they're trying to talk to you about. This is going to become very important in your future careers if you go into pest control or those of you who already are in pest control or if you go into the uh, veterinary services, anything like that, you're going to have people coming in with these common names. So I do want you to understand understand what they mean. Okay, sound good? Anyhow, back to Calimbola. So Calimbola have mouth parts that are adapted for chewing. So they have these mandibulate mouth parts. They feed primarily on plant matter, so they can cause damage to gardens. For this reason, they can be considered a pest in really large numbers, but we seldom see them in huge enough numbers to really cause problems in, say, big agricultural regions. They are useful for environmental testing, though. They're used in laboratory tests specifically for the early detection of, of soil pollution. So if you have uh, soil that is nice and healthy, you're going to have calembola in them. If all the calembola have died, then you have something in that soil that is killing them off. Now, what makes the calembola commonly known as the springtails is they have this tail-like appendage that's shaped kind of like a fork. It's found ventrally on the fourth abdominal segment, and what it's used for is for jumping when threatened. So this organ is called the furculum. So when in use, the furculum is held in place by a stiff band of tissue on the third abdominal segment called the retinaculum. So you've got the furculum on the fourth abdominal segment and the retinaculum on the third abdominal segment. <clears throat> the muscles in the uh, furculum contract and when it is released from the ret retinaculum, this is what causes it to jump. So it basically levers itself up and over in order to jump. Finally, they, the uh, calembola have this ventral tube on the first abdominal segment. This is called a colophore. The colophore function, functions in osmoregulation and in water absorption. The springtail evolved in cool climates, so the relative abundance in the soil tends to increase as the temperature decreases. We can find this group here in Texas, usually during the cooler winter months, especially if you go out digging in really rich soil. Now, on to some of the weird mating habits. Uh, Calembola have some interesting mating habits. Uh, the male doesn't deliver sperm directly to the female, so they are sexual reproducers, but he doesn't actually mate directly with the female. Instead, the male uses something called a spermatophore. This is basically a package of sperm and a package of nutrients that he deposits on a short stalk directly on the substrate. The females will find and take the, those spermatophores directly into their reproductive tracts. This is what they use to fertilize the eggs. Now, there are a bunch of different tactics that the uh, male can use to make sure females find his particular spermatophore. The most primitive is called the, quote, drop and pray method. In this method, the male simply wanders around the environment, dropping spermatophores wherever he goes. He's just basically hoping that a female comes along and finds one. A slightly more advanced method is called grasping. In this method, the males will find a female, drop a spermatophore, and then use his, his antennae to grab the female and drag her across the spermatophore. Basically just, here, pick this up. 
This can work, but it can also be difficult because the males are significantly smaller than the females. So only the strongest males will be able to make this happen and only the most willing females will allow it to happen. A third method is called the love garden. In this case, a male locates a female and then he deposits a lot of spermatophores in a really, really dense group, sort of right in front of her. He then tries to lure the female through this sort of spermatophore minefield. The male could also try this ring of fire method. So in this case, the male will find a sedentary female. She's resting somewhere and he's going to deposit a fence of spermatophores in a ring around her. When she tries to leave, she ends up picking up some of that sperm. Finally, the most advanced mating technique uh, we see in Columbia, at least, is called the mating dance. In this case, the males are going to engage in the, some sort of headbutt type of dance with the female. So they basically try to butt heads with her. Once they get into a rhythm, the female is going to accept him as her mate. He's going to deposit a spermatophore right in front of her and she's going to take it up. Every once in a while, during the beginning of this mating dance, some other males try to get in on the action, but if the female doesn't want to be involved with that male because she is much bigger, she just sort of butts him away, knocks him uh, off of whatever substrate they're standing on, and goes on with her male of choice. But we seldom see them. This pin will give you an idea of why. They're tiny. This minute little creature is a springtail. It's less than half a millimeter long, the size of a full stop. In one square meter of soil, there may be over 10,000 of them. Drying out is a very real danger for them, and some waterproof themselves regularly with a droplet of special grooming fluid. You might even say that they have turned bathing into an art form. They even have two inflatable tubes that enable them to get to those hard to reach places. To help them get around through the leaf litter, these springtails, as their name suggests, have a rather novel way of jumping. They have a tiny two-pronged lever beneath their abdomen. One small flick from it can catapult them six inches, some 15 centimeters, into the air. It's the equivalent of a human being jumping over the Eiffel Tower. And if they happen to land upside down, well, they have a special way of writing themselves. They use their grooming fluid dispenser to stick onto the ground so that they can pull themselves back onto their feet. All right. The next order is called the Diplura. This one is so boring and so rare that we don't even really have a common name for it. Uh, so we commonly call them Diplurans. Now these insects are very tiny. They're usually less than five millimeters long, although, the, although there are some species that can get upwards of 50 millimeters, but they're very, very rare in that case. They have no eyes, not at all, and they have this narrow, elongate body. In general, their overall body is colorless, and they have these maniliform antennae. They also have two abdominal cerci. So these are those extra organs that look like pinchers. They're attached to the last abdominal segment. Now these cerci can uh, break off if mishandled, but they will regrow over the next few molds. So they are very tenuous in that uh, situation. This is one of the few insects that can actually regrow an organ during these molts. I'll talk about another one a little later this week. The insects are very common in grassy or in wooded habitats, but they're very hard to see because they are clear. 
They mostly feed on plant matter, although there are some, especially those with really uh, sclerotized pincher-like cerci, that are carnivorous. They use those cerci as a predatory type of organ. So the video that you're watching here, this is a diplurin that is feeding on a colembolin. So it's much bigger than some of these tiny colembola. It can catch them and it'll just happily prey upon them. When they are predaceous, they use a sit and wait method. So they're going to they're going to wait buried in the soil and then they're going to reach up and grab any uh, other smaller arthropods that happen to walk by. Now, the diplurins exhibit a metabolist development. So they have no real change from the nymph to the adult. When they become sexually mature, they're going to mate much like columbulins. The males will produce spermatophores and they glue them directly to the substrate instead of putting them on stalks like the columbula. Each male can produce up to 200 spermatophores per week. So that's quite a bit. The problem is the sperm will only re remain viable for about two days. So the males have to hope that a female comes along and accepts his sperm or else he won't be able to send the, his genes onto the next generation. The females are going to just sort of wander around their general area and gather up spermatophores. She's going to take them into her genital tract and then she's going to lay her eggs on the ends of these little tiny stalks inside crevices in the ground. All right, so that's it for the first two orders of the semester. Up next, we're going to continue with our investigation of the primitive orders. Let me know if you have any questions.